And just like that, we are uh, back with the first episode of Movie Cinema Film since being back uh, allowed out of our houses. Oh my god, I haven't seen you in, wait, March, April, May, four, wait, four months, almost. Yeah, no, we saw each other right before. uh, Like the day before. Governor Murphy was like, chill out and stay in your houses. Mm -hmm. You know what, I've never... Since we met, we've never gone with more than, like, I don't know, a week without seeing each other. Oh, yeah, definitely not. <laughs> Unless you went on, like, a Disney trip or something. Right, which I'm <laughs> prone to do. Uh, yeah. That is a common habit of Miss Leah Russo. But not now. I do not think they should be open. What the fuck? On the record. <laughs> Disney expert. <laughs> oh, my God. An analyst. And cultural critic of Disney. Honestly, I am. Like, what the hell are they thinking? Especially now, like, they closed when the when the cases in Florida weren't even high at all. And now that they're spiking through the roof, they're like, well, we're, we're going to open anyway. Well, I feel like Disney is all about magic. Right. And the magic just shows through. They have, like, a barrier. Yeah. You can't get the disease if you have magic. Obviously not. Yes. Yeah. You heard it here, everybody. Wow, that would be bad if if somebody reported this to the CDC. That'd be horrible. They're just like, movie cinema film is giving bad medical advice. (laughs) I thought that they were my doctor. Yeah, I don't condone going to Disney. So I have a lot of followers that like I don't know, and they just follow me because I am a princess, I guess, and because I go to Disney, and. I've had a couple people say, like, are you going to go? Like, are you planning to go this year? And I'm like, no. (laughs) Like, first of all, I've already been there a million times. Like, I I mean, I still think it's wrong, even if you, like, if you have a -a once-in-a-lifetime trip and you have non-refundable, like, plane or whatever, like, I still think you shouldn't go. But at least those people have, like, somewhat of a reason. If you're like me, like, they had an annual pass holder preview day where it was only pass holders. I'm like, so people, I have a pass. Like, like people that go all the time, they just have to go right now. Like, you've seen it. <laughs> I don't get it. That's my rant for today, but it's probably not going to be the last one, so buckle up. I hope there's multiple rants today. Yeah. It's been a long time. Yeah. Uh, Jordan and I are both Aries. Yes. It's been, it's been tough being inside as an Aries. It's tough to make your moves. It's tough to be... Uh, out in front of your future. Yeah. <laughs> and we're performers, so it's like, help. Yes. Yeah. It's been been very rough, but we've been watching a lot of movies. Uh, I have recently become a subscriber of the Criterion channel. Nice. Uh, which was probably the best decision of my filmmaking life, mm-hmm. I guess. Uh, I don't know if you normal people will enjoy it as much as I do, but if you are a film fanatic... You need it. Everything is on there, including, like, the Olympics from, like, random years from really? the 50s or 30s. Yeah. I didn't know that. There's, like, very old footage of that. They have, like, very diverse filmmakers, queer filmmakers, black filmmakers, indigenous filmmakers. They have a very wide variety. It's very mm-hmm. enlightening to see the filmmakers that the mainstream has hidden from you. That's, yeah. like, how I see the channel. There's a lot of films that, like, you can find on another streaming app, but for the most part, it's hard to find stuff that you would have seen at, like, Cannes 30 years ago or, like, mm-hmm. the Venice Film Festival 20 years ago. Just yeah. random stuff like that. It's a film fan's fantasy. Yes, I'm trying to coerce Leah into getting it. Well, I have some of the DVDs. I know I sound like 80 when I say that. I love Criterion DVDs. And actually, I had a Netflix subscription for a while. I think this was... um, I mean, like, I have regular Netflix, but I had, like, a DVD subscription for a while, mainly just so I could rent all the Criterion movies, because buying them is kind of expensive. They have, like, all the features, and, like, because they're Criterion, they're more expensive. It's, like, $30 for a DVD. So I had a, um, a DVD like mail-in thing that I would do and I would rent all of them just to get those movies because like, oh, some of them you really can't find yeah no Netflix definitely has a good film archive they rival Criterion for sure I'd say Criterion has a lot of stuff that's like preserved film <laughs> yeah uh, and then Netflix has just everything that's ever existed mm-hmm. also so yeah. definitely support Netflix's DVDs as they try to take down Apple and Amazon. I hope that Netflix, like, I mean, I don't know, 
what they're doing in terms of money because they must be making a shitload of money right now. Like, they're one of the companies that actually had an advantage of the quarantine. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if they got more subscribers, though. I think it's kind of bad for Netflix because when you think about it, wouldn't, uh, wouldn't you stop subscribing to something once you watch all the films? Like, I feel like people are going to run out of things on Netflix if we go through this for another year. Netflix is going to have to get a new catalog with enough to fill up years and years of information for people. They're going to have to spend a lot more money getting stuff that they've never hosted before. Because obviously they can't have new stuff if we're in this for a year. They're not, they're halted production, so. Yeah, that's very real. Yeah. Maybe some independent filmmakers, though, will get their starts because of this. A lot of people who haven't been seen yet. I hope so. Like us. <laughs> yeah, or the future, the future generations of filmmakers. Like, how do you do this? Uh, how can you make a film if you don't have the infrastructure of Hollywood? Which, like, the infrastructure of Hollywood just makes a film $5 million immediately. Yeah. Basically. <laughs> and it doesn't have to be. What? It doesn't have to be. Oh, yeah, for sure. Just look at um, something like Clerks, you know? Yeah, Clerks is very, very simple and also very Jersey. Mm hmm. Yeah. I think it cost him, I think he said like $28,000. And he, like, put it mostly on credit. And it's so funny because if you think about that movie now, we could do that for so much less than $28,000. Like, we could we could do that with our iPhones, you know, without having to rent all of that equipment. I mean, we still need the lighting equipment and stuff. But um, if we had access to, like, a store like he did that he already worked at, you know, that kind of movie we could, I mean, we could be at Sundance in a couple years. Like, let's do it. I'm down. Yeah. I have an idea. My mom gave me a very good idea for a movie. Really? You might recognize her as the disembodied voice from my short film, Wings. Yeah. Uh, but she has a good idea. Maybe it'll end up being a film in uh, a year. Um, it's very easy to improvise, which if you know Jordan Freed films, that is something that we like to do. We need to do that. Um, yeah. It also requires very few people. And now you guys have to guess the entire plot. Yeah. At home. Hmm. So write it on uh, the Instagram page what you think this movie is going to be about, and then in a year you'll see if it's actually what that movie is. Mm hmm. We're we're making moves over here. Oh yeah, thinking houses. about getting IMDb Pro. I'm going to email <laughs> all the agents of all the biggest names and everything. Uh huh. It's going to be good. We're going to be making deals. I have a film financer on the line. Yeah. But if you, if you want to give me more money, that's cool. I would love some money. Um, Any money. We have a lot of great film ideas. Mm -hmm. We're putting together some, some shows all around. We've been... Uh, How's it been going at Weed Man's? Uh, yeah. Uh, Late Night Hump has been back at New Jersey Weed Man's joint every first, second, and third Wednesday of the month. Uh... Weed Man's on vacation the next week, though, so we'll be back in August. Um, <laughs> he holds up this entire community, guys. He needs a break. Yeah, no. <laughs> it, it's tough being New Jersey's entire Weed Man. Yeah. Um, but no, it's it's just good to uh, be back and running. Like, I just went to visit his establishment because he has great munchies there um, and whatnot. And uh, he was like, oh, like, bring the comedy back. Like, what are you doing? Like, we have a backyard. So, yeah, we've been back. Um, we social distance. We put on masks. We had the very funny Gregory Hall last week. Uh, he's a Jersey City comic. Uh, first week we had Talent Harris Jr., who is very funny, has been His on other shows in the past. Yeah. Wow, that's His pressure. dad is just known as, like, Talent the Comedian. Like, he <laughs> is just talent, and he's, like, a famous Jersey comic. Wow. Yeah, and they're both hilarious. Yeah, like, talent obviously came from talent. Mm hmm <laughs> <laughs> But it's, like, funny, because, like, when I'll promote his stuff, he'll always tell me differently how I'm supposed to notate his name so that I'm not, like, <laughs> stepping on his dad's toes. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. Wow. It must be weird to share a name with somebody. I just exposed uh, the other Jordan Freed. I was just like, because oh, somebody posted, why is your handle what it is? And I was just like, well, my handle is Jay Freeze because Jordan Freed was already taken. 
buy like this hedge fund Bitcoin finance bro. Oh my god, you need to try to like scam somebody with his identity. No, legit. I have a screenplay that I want him to read. <laughs> if anybody knows this Jordan Freed, I think he went to Buffalo. He's really into Bitcoin. Um, oh my god. Hook me up with him because he definitely has enough money to fi- fund a film. Yeah. So, And it's also very promotional for Jordan Freed's of the world. We need to get all the Jordan Freed's together. And then there's Jerry Freed's, who's just taking Jay Freed's. And he is just in egg emoji. He doesn't even have what? a real face. Yeah. Oh my god, upload a profile pic. Yeah, so that's been a big bummer Yeah. in my digital life, but we're trying to make it through. Mm-hmm. Jordan Freed, if you're listening, uh, help me with your investments um, and fund our films. There is another Leah Russo uh, who, <laughs> her, well, she goes by, on IMDb, she goes by with her middle name, so her name is Leah Mariella Russo. That's but kind of ironic. <laughs> she was credited in a uh, very small indie film that you probably haven't heard of called Avengers Endgame as <laughs> Leah Russo. So um, when that movie came out, there was a lot of attention coming to my Instagram and things like that because people thought that I was her. But she's actually the daughter of the Russo, one of the Russo brothers. Oh. And she spells her name like I do, which I spell it L-I-A. A lot of people don't do that. So um, That also sucks when a celebrity child has your name. Because I know. it's like, of course, they're going to get all the opportunities Like, fuck you, name. yeah. <laughs> but the thing, the thing that's good is I'm not, I mean, I don't know. I'm totally speculating. But I don't think that she actually wants to be an actress. I think that she just was in Avengers because her dad directed it. So it's like, why not be in the Avengers if you can? But Yeah, why not? It doesn't seem like she's really pursuing acting that much like her imdb doesn't have a photo of her it's just like very few credits and i feel like if my dad was a russo brother then i and i wanted to be an actress like she probably have more parts by now but (laughs) who knows she's probably like starring in the next john apatow movie and everyone's gonna be like oh like you can't use that name so (laughs) i don't know yeah but can they really tell you not to use your name? I guess if they have it copyrighted. Damn. Well, the thing is, she it's with SAG. Also so SAG, like, yeah. So I'm SAG eligible, but she's in SAG, but I think she's in SAG under Leah Mariella Russo. So if that is the case, then I can join as Leah Russo, but if not, I'm going to have to join as Cecilia or another name. Wow. That must be fun. You can think about that for the rest of quarantine. I know. I could go by, like, Poison Ivy if I want to. (laughs) (laughs) Do whatever I want. So thank you for giving me that freedom, Leah Russo. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I don't know if anybody in SAG has my name. I just found out that uh, my dad is a producer, according to uh, something. There's an Andrew Freed who produces... Uh, <laughs> Cheer, that documentary on Netflix I was telling you about. Wow, there's not enough names, honestly. Yeah. <laughs> it just, it's weird because now people are going to think that I'm getting nepotism if I get a job because they're going to be like, oh, Jordan Freed with his dad, Andrew Freed, like, oh, the producer of this Cheer documentary. <laughs> the famous You're going to be like, Andrew. no, he was just a teacher. Jesus Christ. <laughs> like, yeah. Now teachers are the connected people, right? Yeah, totally. That would be nice if teachers could get some play in this world. That would be good. Yeah. Instead of being underpaid. And but. privatized and turned into <sighs> boxes on a computer program. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we're here to talk about movies that have come out since we've been in quarantine. That Which we've you did seen. reference uh, one of the key players in that, Mr. Judd Apatow. Oh, yes. Did you see King of Staten Island? I did. Did you? Yes. What'd cool. You think? So we can give our opinions on it. Wow. Are we, wait, are we doing like... Are we I feel like, like no a, spoilers tonight, right? No spoilers. Okay. Yeah. Unless like we want to. Unless it will give you a warning, so we'll see. Maybe we'll it. give some spoilers for uh, Palm Springs, which is like the main focus of this episode. Yeah, that was we'll, we'll do great. that last. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that'll that that's a good guideline to go by. We'll do that last, and we will talk spoilers. Um, but yeah, I I didn't think I was gonna like the King of Staten Island. I actually thought I was going to hate it. Really? And I was kind of surprised that my parents paid for it. And I was just like, why did you guys pay for this? Um, but then once my parents paid for it, then I watched it. And I was delightfully surprised. I I kind of felt the opposite. I thought I was going to love it. And I was like, kind of more like middle on it. Oh, that's funny. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I just like, at this point, like, 
Judd Apatow's made so many, like, average movies in the past, like, five to ten years. That yeah. it's kind of like, all right, like, I'm waiting for, like, the good one. Which, like, this one was, like, an upswing. But mm-hmm. I definitely, like, am more hesitant because it's not, like, old Apatow where it felt like he was, like, covering ground or doing something new. Now it just feels like... He's not allowed to say some of the stuff that he used to be able to say, and he doesn't have anything else to say because he can't make the jokes that he used to make. Mm-hmm. Sometimes. Which is, like, good why this film had some had some heart to it, I guess. Some yeah. heart to the comedy. Well, I do really enjoy this thing that he's been doing. I mean, I know he didn't direct Big Sick, but he... Uh, produced it and worked with the writers on it oh, and I didn't know that. yeah I love that movie that's one of my favorite movies of the past five years it's really one of my favorite movies ever and he did the same thing with Amy Schumer um, like he worked with her on a story that was like big sick was closer to the actual real of what happened in train wreck but you know that was also kind of based on experiences that she had had and then I don't hate train wreck. I like it. I like Trainwreck. It didn't age well, obviously, but I I generally (laughs) feel because I I bring up Amy Schumer a lot because I just like love women in comedy that are dominating, and she, I mean, I think she's awesome. I know a lot of people don't like her. A lot of people don't like her specific type of comedy, but I feel like even if you don't like her type of comedy, you have to kind of respect that she has. I mean, before the pandemic, she's doing like arenas, and and like a lot of women in comedy do not do arenas. Like it's just you know, it's still such a man's. It's like a boys club uh, But actually speaking of her I just watched her new documentary Expecting Amy on HBO Max Wow, was it good? It was really good I was. Well, we can get back to King of Staten Island No, but we can bounce around it's like, This it's is like, loose, everybody missed us Oh, they, <laughs> they love my tangents So it's about Her pregnancy And the birth of her son And she had some really, really Really difficult well, I should, shouldn't say some. All of the days of her pregnancy were really difficult because she had this rare condition, which I can't remember the name of it now, but uh, you know how women have morning sickness, like at the beginning or whatever? She had all day sickness and vomiting every day of her pregnancy. Wow. So, and, and she was doing a tour and filming a Netflix special while this was all happening. So she literally would get on stage and be like, if I run off stage, don't freak out. I, it's because I have to vomit. Like, I have this condition. And she... Is very honest about it. She um, shows everything. She shows her C-section like it's graphic. Um, she shows like her her like very big, pregnant, like bloated, um, naked body with like her enlarged nipples from breastfeeding, and like she shows everything. Like no fear, and she's like, I did it because women need to know like what this is. She's like, you know that it's going to be hard to have a baby. Like no one thinks their pregnancy is going to be easy, but like I had no idea what was going to happen to me and happen to my body and like it's kind of part of a bigger conversation that women are just expected to like grin and bear it and be like pretty and smile and just be like yeah I'm tired but you know it's okay it's all worth it for the baby and stuff and she's she was just like I mean she was so graphic about and she showed um just everything they she showed herself vomiting like she wanted it's mostly filmed by like her and her husband and her friends it's not like a professional crew most of the time and she really like during the tough times like she would say like turn on the camera where other people would be like okay I need like some off camera time and it it was just really like I hate when people call women brave for doing things because it's it's like kind of condescending but it's like the bravest thing I've seen in a while wow I do recommend it I'll have to check it out yeah it made me terrified um to get pregnant ever so which is a problem because I want to have kids uh but you know adopting sounds fine to me so (laughs) I feel like I feel like also just men need to watch that because I feel like men don't know any of the stuff that goes into that and they're just like yeah just pull out and it's like oh my god like that's that's not chill (laughs) yeah like okay you carry the baby uh yeah but interesting HBO Max knocking HBO Go out yeah basically not adding anything to the HBO sphere it's just better branding I guess I'm very blessed that I have we have Verizon here but my parents have Optimum so I get Mm -hmm. both cable subscriptions which results in a lot of streaming services so that's how I have HBO Max and I like it like I really like HBO Max they have a lot of good stuff and I'm always like when it when I first got it I was like oh my god do I really need another service like is this really 
necessary, but I did, and <laughs> I'm enjoying it. I'm rewatching Six Feet Under right now. I've never watched it, so oh. maybe that is something I should binge. It's even better than I remembered, which is saying something because for the past, I think the, I think I watched it originally like five or six years ago, and because I remember watching it during the summer, so it must have been like five or six years. And since then, I've been telling everybody to watch it, but it's even better than I remember. It's so like especially dealing like how just how it deals with death and life and like the meaning of all of that stuff and like what's the point of it and everything and I, I already am I'm so excited for the finale because the finale is literally the best finale in the history of television I think and like wow it's so it's just the way that it it um, sums up the whole series and honestly this sounds so broad but like the way that it sums up life and like the human experience and death and like why it's important to live a certain way that that you want to rather than whatever other people say you should or whatever and the concept of like moving on to different points of your life and then like moving on when you die like all that kind of stuff they handle it like it's just such a broad concept but they handle it so beautifully I think you would love it because you're into that like you're into that like psychological theoretical philosophical life and death stuff cool yeah Yeah, no I'll definitely (laughs) check it out yeah um, speaking of being who you want to be and who you are and, like, making sure you live life to the fullest, uh, did you watch Disclosure on Netflix? No, I'm so excited to watch it, though. Uh, yeah, that is mandatory reading for any of you movie, cinema, film people out there. Uh, it is the ultimate film history, I guess, of, like, trans representation Mm -hmm. in, uh, film and TV and just, like, media in general. Uh, and if you are not well educated on the subject, like there are a lot of trans people who talk about representation and the films that were good for trans people in the world and the films that were not good from their personal experiences mm-hmm. and films that added to the stigmas that have created uh, such a high murder rate in the country for trans people, especially trans people of color, black mm-hmm. trans people. Uh, so in general, just educate yourself on that stuff because uh, it's important too. Because yes. we should all be welcoming to people of all uh, walks of life and letting people be who they are. All Instead genders. Instead of forcing them to be something that they're not. Yeah, so trans. What's the point? Trans people are murdered almost every single day in America. I don't know what's going on in the rest of the world, but I know that for a fact. And it's just like obviously. I don't even know the word. It's beyond horrible, but um, it's so rarely reported on. And I feel like it was only reported on recently more because there have been some black trans people that have been murdered recently and because of the Black Lives Matter, the reignition of the movement. Yeah. Um, It's been totally, like, in the spotlight, but usually it's not in the spotlight. Like, usually... Usually these people do not... Oh, have a great first day! (laughs) She's starting a job today. That was my roommate, everybody. (laughs) Um, It's always good to have guest stars. Yeah. Especially uh, after months of not seeing people. I was just kind of like (laughs) saying hi, and then I remember she's starting at her new job today. But, yeah, I've actually been... Don't... Well... (laughs) One of the, because I wish I had more money to donate, but one of the causes that I chose to donate to was the Homeless Black Trans Women Fund. And it's now, when I donated, it was like in the thousands, and now it's up to $2.7 million raised. And it's in Los Angeles, and it's, look it up if you haven't, it's on all of those like Black Lives Matter, um, like the cards and everything. It's the Homeless Black Trans Women Fund. It's on GoFundMe. You should donate because they're trying to get to $3 million. And it, the reason, one of the reasons why I picked that one, because obviously there's so many different like GoFundMe's and different organizations and charities and stuff. But I chose that one because I love the movie Tangerine, which I've talked about before on this podcast. And that movie just makes you feel so close to those girls, like, and their struggle and being on the streets and, you know, being homeless and, you know, being sex workers. And I just really feel I, like movies are how I kind of process the world and how I have since I was a kid and how I learn about different cultures and different ways of life. And I feel like that movie connected me to those people even though I really like I don't know 
I actually do know one black trans woman, but not very well. We're kind of like more acquaintances. So I don't really know her experience, but I feel like from Tangerine, I have some semblance of knowledge of it. Whereas like without that, I probably wouldn't. So that just like connected me. It's like building a complete picture as opposed to just one thing that you see on the news or like one thing that you read one time in like some headline that was meant to be clickbait. Like Mm -hmm. if you don't have an overarching like view of a bunch of people's opinions of, like, what's going on, then, like, how could you accurately know, you know? Yeah. Because, like, even, you could think about, like, family stuff even, (laughs) you Mm -hmm. know? Like, even within families, people uh, have different perceptions of how things are, Mm -hmm. you know? And just think about how you would feel about people who don't look like you and don't operate the same way that you operate, Mm -hmm. and just how much somebody would have to see of your family to understand your family and how they operate. Yeah. And, like, that's, like, how much you should put into, like, trying to have empathy for other people, I feel like. Yeah. I thought about it a lot during quarantine, actually, because I think that watching movies, especially growing up, it influenced me so much. Like, it's just so funny how I, I would be such a different person, and so much of that is because... I think even things that I got more into after seeing a movie about them that I then learned about and would read books or do research online, I wouldn't even have known about if it wasn't for movies. And I think it's kind of sad that people... Like, I totally understand limiting screen time for kids, but I don't like that watching TV is kind of considered, like, oh, you're rotting your brain in front of the TV. Like, you should read something or you should go outside. It's like, I think you can learn so so much from watching. I mean, if you're watching, you know, Real Housewives or Kardashians all day, then then yeah, that's, you know, not that you can't do that. Entertain pure entertainment is completely fine too. If you just want to be entertained and that's it, that is completely fine. I'm not even trying to shame those people because that is valid too. But if you're watching like great movies all day that educate you and tr- and teach you about other people's experiences, that's that's to me as good as reading a book. Like I would rather, I mean, I love books, but I would rather I would rather see movies. Yeah, I have a rule with my girlfriend how we basically, for the most part, like, if it's like a lazy Sunday or something, we'll watch something narrative during the day. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, we only watch documentaries or, like, very, like, artsy films during Mm -hmm. the daytime. Yeah. Because we're like, we need to at least be educating ourselves in one day. Yeah, I thought about that during quarantine, too. Like, I'm not saying that I don't watch anything that's, like... Like, I watch things that aren't going to advance my brain. Of course I do. Like, I, I I, love just turning on YouTube and, like, whatever, you know? I mean, although there's a lot of educational, really good stuff on YouTube, but, I mean, like, just the silly stuff on YouTube, too, or, like, beauty channels and stuff. I love that stuff. But especially, I think, when you're in quarantine and you're not working... Well, I'm working a little, but for the most part, it's, like, you have to exercise your brain. And I do read. I have read in quarantine, but for me, like... I think just because I'm such a movie-obsessed person, I need the images, and I need the cinematography, and I need the artistry of a performance, and or, or even, like you're saying, a documentary, something that I can really think about and gets my brain going. Yeah, and I think that's honestly like where streaming services come in handy, because in the past, uh, documentaries have not been able to make money whatsoever. There's something about a documentary that does not get people to go out to the theaters. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if it does feel like, oh, they're showing me this education, or like, oh, my teacher is making me go see this documentary. Mm -hmm. But like now that we have streaming services, it's just like, oh, this is included with money I already pay. Like, I watch this. Like, now I feel smarter because I watch this. As opposed to, oh, I wanted to see Quentin Tarantino, and now I'm watching this boring documentary about the (laughs) one-child policy in China. Yeah. You know? Which, like, you need to know about. (laughs) Like, Mm -hmm. if you want to be informed about the world and, like, how cultures influence each other, like, you need to know about the one-child policy in China and how much it's influenced their culture and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And how that's forced people out of their place of living for generations. Yeah. Well, we should probably get back to King of Staten Island. <laughs> yeah, well, we could bounce around. We can bounce around. <laughs> no, what? the performances were really good, right? Um, yeah. Bill Burr was really good. I felt like he was pitch perfect. I always love Marissa Tomei. I think she's one of the best actresses ever, literally. Yeah. Uh, I don't think that's a hot take. No, no, it's no. It's a very no. lukewarm take. It's, yeah. a, it's a very, uh, <laughs> it's like a pre- political take. Like, it's just like, we can all agree with this. Um, I was thinking this. 
say? Oh, I saw, or I heard Pete Davidson on Stern, and the interview was really good, and he was just in his mom's basement, and he's just, like, such a normal guy, and he's gone through so much with his losing his dad, and he has a lot of issues that he was really open about. It was really cool, like, you know, Howard always has that way of asking people things without seeming too, um... Like a without seeming like a sleazy like journalist who's like you know so what about your relationship and all that kind of stuff like he was able to talk about his mental health and how he you know has a psychiatrist but he also has a specialist that he talks to and all the kind of stuff that he was like he was just very open about how the struggle in the movie is really his real life struggle and how if he didn't find comedy he was like I would be in a really bad like I you know I don't even know if I would be here basically and so that was a real like that's a good that made me like the movie more because I actually heard that after I saw the movie it just gives a more clear picture and like makes the movie more full-bodied when you see that so I recommend listening to that especially because you can get serious free for four months now so just cancel after four months if you don't want. It's kind of expensive to pay for, but I really like that he wasn't a comic in the movie. Yeah, that would have made this movie so bad if he was a comedian. I'm so glad that he was a tattoo artist. <laughs> I would have been so pissed. Well, I thought the tattoo stuff was funny. Like yeah. that—that that was a better device to use. That's a good physical gag. Yeah, and the whole thing with like just the way that that the the inciting incident basically is when he tattoos that kid which was really that was a funny scene you know he's Pete's really good at um the throwaway jokes and humor like he doesn't have to hit something too hard for it to be funny I feel like that's kind of his whole thing on SNL too he's just kind of like there he doesn't have to really you know he's not he's not like Chris Farley which Chris Farley is like probably my favorite comedic actor ever but he doesn't that's not his type of comedy you know he he just sit there like when he's doing like the Chad thing well, that's why he sucks at SNL because <laughs> like SNL is all about being over the top you yeah. know like I feel like now when we think about comedy it's more like literary and like what did they say that's so funny and less like physical yeah wait speaking of that you know what I finally watched during quarantine that is so good what Fleabag. Oh, wow. Did you watch it? Uh, I did not. I got bored after the first episode or two. Okay, listen to me. Listen to me. I did the same thing when... This was probably like a year or two ago. I watched the first episode. I was like, this is totally not for me. I don't get it. I don't like it. And then I heard from so many people that I like trust and I have the same opinions usually. And they were like, just trust me, like, you have to watch this. Even even if you, like, hate the first, like, half of the season, watch it, get to season two. I'm like, okay. And, again, like, I didn't really love the first episode, second episode, but the whole thing is only 12 half-hour episodes, so you really can watch it very quickly. And even if, like, you get through the first few episodes and you're, like, working at the same time, you're doing it or whatever, that's fine. You just kind of need, like, a basic understanding of, <laughs> of the family and, and that kind of stuff. Once you get to season two, the way that they portray this love story and, ha- like, uh, the way that they express why this person that she's connecting with is, like, her person is something I've never seen before in TV or movies ever and I watch a million things so that's really saying something it's so unique the way they deal with family drama and issues it's unbelievable like I I can't wait to watch it again actually I was literally like it was one of those things where I was just completely floored watching it so I I told Brennan this too I said I said the same thing to Brennan I was like texting him about it like aggressively being like you need to watch because I for some reason I thought of him like I feel like he would especially like it so Brennan Mm. O'Brien if you're listening get turn on Uh, I already got him to get on the kidding train oh which is very good that's Jim Carrey's yes 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 basically playing a Mr. Rogers figure I love Jim Carrey (laughs) well then you should be watching this because this is probably the best thing he's ever done ever well I have seen a few episodes of it I wasn't like in love with it but I do want to see the rest of it because I just think he's a genius like he's I think he's one of the best overall performers of like our time because I love him also as a dramatic actor um I, I, li- I think I like him more as a dramatic actor than a comedian. Yeah. I mean, he's such an iconic... He 
he's such an iconic comedian too but I yeah. love like for me as much as I love his comedic roles it doesn't compare to Truman Show and Eternal Sunshine like, he's also great in Man in the Moon and The Majestic and um, some other you know ones he did more recently even the films that are not as good like Number 23 or or whatever um, things like that I still love him in but to me those two movies are like elite level like genius genius work also like Man on the Moon wasn't that great of a film. Like, when I watched it, I didn't love it. But, like, the Jim and Andy documentary, just, like, the fodder that he gave for that documentary oh, yeah. is, like, just cinema in itself. And it's almost like, yeah, it's like it feels like performance art, like, of what people think an actor is. And, like, I'm going to just be this guy now because, like, this is what people want me to be. They want me to be this actor who does method things. Mm-hmm. Did you see that doc? I Jim did. Yeah. I did. Well, I think his whole... I mean, he actually literally believes that Andy Kaufman was, like, channeling, like, his spirit was, like, channeling through him when he was performing. Which you also believe. I believe that something like that can happen. I wouldn't rule out something like that. If, he, if that's what he feels, that's what he feels. How, like, who am I to I wasn't there. I'm not in his body. Who am I to say that that didn't happen? I don't fucking know. <laughs> I didn't think a virus was going to, you know, be taking the world over, so I don't know anything. <laughs> I'm open to I'm open to it I just think he's And I, I just like how A few years ago I feel like he really Started talking about Again like I think It's really important For comedians to talk About mental health Because a lot of comedians End up hurting themselves Or are dealing with Tremendous pain And he is someone also Who's come out And been like I have depression I deal with a lot of shit And uh, He's talked about Really serious issues And I think the honesty there is really important, especially for young people that just like look up to him as this like God, you know? Yeah. I actually watched the cable guy. I haven't seen the cable guy since I was probably like five or something. And I watched it for, um, for the first time since then a few nights ago. Have you seen the cable guy? No, but isn't that Avatar? It is. It's an early, like, he produced <laughs> it. He didn't direct it. Ben Stiller actually directed oh, it. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's considered to be like a weird move for Jim Carrey at the time because he had just come off of like The Mask and uh, Ace Ventura, which were like two really big commercial hits, and he was like the biggest star in the world. And it's a really weird movie about this cable guy who um, comes to install the cable in Matthew Broderick's uh, new apartment and just kind of like weasels his way into his life it's almost like a single white female like he kind of becomes obsessed with him and they have this weird friendship and he like takes over his life in certain ways and it's a really weird performance like you could tell that Jim Carrey was just like okay like I have everything I'm the biggest star in the world I somehow made it as a comedian and now I can do whatever I want he just made this like very strange movie and actually I think at the time it tanked and people didn't really like it but it's one of those movies that I just keep hearing about like it comes up all the time and the reason why I decided to watch it is because I was listening to a Judd Apatow interview for King of Staten Island and the people that were interviewing him were like oh my god the cable guy like you know and it's just one of those movies that's kind of like come back in people's minds now so you should watch it I don't think it's like it sounds very relevant to our times yeah like, no. I feel like now there is like this mentality of like oh I'd rather just meet a stranger than like people <laughs> I already know in my life which like I feel like before 2000 like nobody really felt that yeah. But now that we have the internet, people are always like, oh, well, what's this? What's this thing I don't know? Hmm. What's what's that guy walking down the street? Oh, like, is he is he going to be my friend now? Maybe. Maybe yeah. he has some good recommendations about the restaurants around here. <laughs> I also think people are kind of desperate for connection right now. Yeah. Because it's just hard. You know, you can't. I'm not. I'm pretty much an introvert anyway, but. You know, you can't meet people normally. Like, you can't go to the same things that you would go to to meet someone or make a friend or anything, you know? And I'm not on dating apps or any kind of apps, but I know there's also, like, even just friendship apps. And it's, like, that makes me uncomfortable. So, like, if I met someone, if I did happen to meet someone who I, like, really liked, I wouldn't act like Jim Carrey and the cable guy, but I probably would be kind of like, hey, like, can we please be friends? Because, like, it's quarantine and, like, I connect with you. <laughs> you see that stuff, though, yeah. especially for people in their, like, 20s. Like, 
it's so hard to meet people once you get out of college and you're like out of that bubble where it's like socially acceptable to just talk to strangers constantly. Yeah. Because then you're like, oh, well, like, I don't know if this person's here with their friends. I don't know if they're going to think I'm weird because I'm talking to them while they're at a bar. Like, I don't think, I don't know if they're going to think I'm weird that I come into their restaurant every day. Yeah. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. like, I, I don't know what their life is, you know, I don't know what they want in their life. <laughs> yeah. But like, I feel like when you're younger, it's like, oh, everybody wants friends. That's just what you do when you're a kid is like, you want friends. Mm-hmm. But then once you're older, I feel like people are like, who, who are you? Why, why are you trying to take my money? Why are you trying to get me to do stuff? Why are you, <laughs> why are you talking to me? <laughs> I know it's, it's weird. There's like a paranoia. Cause I think, I don't know. Like sometimes I'll have like girl crushes, not like romantic or sexual. I mean, like, a, I mean like a girl crush, like I want to be friends with this girl. And I'm like, but how do I like put myself out there as a friend? Like, how do I just be like, like, I, it's, it's hard for me to just be, to go from like an acquaintance with someone to be like, Hey, like, let's hang out. Like I'm not that person. So it kind of has to happen naturally. Like, like with us, like in, in a situation with like Rhino or other like comedic or actor things, it just kind of happens naturally. Cause you go from the show to a bar or, or whatever. And you, then you end up going to movies or something like, but it's hard for me in general. Like I'm, I'm not like, I don't know what it is, but I can't just do that. You know? It's also tough because I think a lot of people have gotten lazier because things are so instant. Mm -hmm. So nobody wants to be the first person to plan sometimes. Mm -hmm. Or you have the other situation where people over plan. And then then it's like, oh, well, I'm always missing out on things because I plan too early. And then I'm not like (laughs) spontaneous and in the moment. Yeah. You have to be spontaneous because you don't know like... And even sometimes I get really, this is so stupid, but, like, I'll get insecure about, like, if I do ask somebody to hang out, like, guy or girl, it's, like, it, and, they, and they're, like, oh, I would love to, but, like, I have plans or whatever. They could just genuinely, literally have plans, and they're <laughs> not blowing me off, but they're just, like, yeah, like, I have plans. And I get so, I'm like, oh my God, like they don't want to hang out with me and I'm not going to ask them again. And <laughs> you know what I mean? I'll, I'll just be like, cause I'm not persistent like that. I've had some people in my life that have been like that. Like one of my closest friends, Jess, like we actually met online and, um, when she, and she was like very aggressively, like, oh my gosh, like we, like you're the same as me. Like we would be friends and everything. And I was like, who is this girl? Like, that's kind of weird. And when I met her in person, <laughs> I met her in person actually at Disney. Cause we both love Disney. And so we were at Disney at the same time. And she saw my social media that I was there and she, she, uh, DM me and she was like, Hey, she was like, I saw that you're here. She's like, I'm here too. Do you want to meet up? And like, you know, if not, it's okay. But like, do you want to, I just thought it, you know, it'd be fun to me. And I told my mom, I'm like, okay, if she's weird, like just say that you don't feel good and we have to go back to the room or something like that. And she was like, okay, okay. And we ended up like, I'm, I'm so happy that she was outgoing like that. Cause I would never have done that ever. And it now resulted in, that was like nine years ago. That was 2011. So like, we've now been friends for nine years. Like she's one of my best friends of all time. I cannot imagine if I had never met her. And I'm like, thank God she was so like, I would never do that, but maybe I should start doing (laughs) something like that. I feel like I'm starting to have that with veganism. There's definitely like social media accounts that are like popping up in like multiple places just because like I follow vegan accounts sometimes just to get like vegan follows back because I post vegan food sometimes. Mm -hmm. And like I'm in like vegan Facebook groups and then I'm also, like, following vegan people on Instagram. So then I'll, like, see the same person in, like, both groups. And I'm like, this is kind of weird. Like, are you my <laughs> friend now? Like, if I saw you in person, would you say hi to me? Like, this is kind of weird. Yeah. Like, there's even people who have, like, commented on my stuff. And I'm like, oh, like, are we are we boys now? Like, is this happening? <laughs> like, what's going on? Like, there's some dude who lives in asbury park and like i'm sure he's gonna end up listening to this podcast because i feel like he stalks me jk i don't think you stalk me i'm not gonna name you on this podcast whoever you are but like <laughs> he legit has been flynn rider he's like obsessed no with way. Dainty, and he's also a vegan <laughs> so what? so like he like slides into my stuff every once in a while and i'm like oh, okay cool and I, like, I didn't realize how, like, he became associated with me, but then I started to see that he was, like, in multiple spheres of, like, New Jersey, like, online <laughs> culture. <laughs> and now I just see, like, his bachelor parties and 
stuff like that and like what's going on in his life and all of his like gay getaways and it's just like a different life wow <laughs> and i'm like cool maybe we'll be friends when covid's over but until then i'm just gonna like view your life <laughs> yeah yeah i have connections like that too online where like i don't really know them personally but we have obvious similarities and like we just kind of like each other's stuff from time to time and maybe send a dm but it's nothing like i don't want to say it's not real but it's not like close or whatever but for those of you who are listening who don't know jordan is the perfect flynn rider <laughs> so calm down ladies i know i know but <laughs> you should see him in the costume uh yeah. Once Upon a Princess NJ Instagram, check it out. I thought you were gonna say for those who don't know, Jordan and I will accept any unsolicited <laughs> friendships online. We clearly want friends. <laughs> it's a good thing you and I are friends because if we didn't have a friendship right now, it would be really sad because it would be like, oh wait, like should we be friends? <laughs> <laughs> There's this like very weird thing that happened after like three weeks into quarantine or so. Where there's, like, this comedian's group chat yeah. or Zoom chat that happens literally every night by a random comic who I never met in person before quarantine started. And now I'm just in this Facebook chat of, like, these random New Jersey comedians. <laughs> and I'm just like, I don't want to be in this chat. I went one day. <laughs> and, like, I literally just have to see them be like, wow, it was a crazy chat last night. And I'm just like, was it really? <laughs> or are you just trying to get people to oh go into this God. weird Zoom chat? That's funny. Like, the first day I thought he was, like, trying to book me. Me on a show and then all of a sudden it was like oh yeah we're just having like a zoom chat of all comedians who i know and it's like cool but like <laughs> is it is this like where we're at like i guess i'm in a very different place during quarantine and i have like a lot of privilege in the fact that i like am with my best friend and i'm with my girlfriend mm -hmm. and i'm with somebody else who is a good friend in yeah. quarantine <laughs> yeah you have a good living situation and i i am very blessed because there's probably a lot of people our age who are living completely alone and don't even have roommates or got into a weird living situation right before this started. Mm -hmm. You and I both, like, moved and haven't really been <laughs> able to explore our town since, like, being in a new place. Yeah. And it's just, like, very weird, like, living in a place and not knowing anybody and not being able to meet anybody. Because, <laughs> yeah. like, I moved in the fall, and then after that it was like, oh, yep, stay inside. It's cold out. Yeah. I, I grew up in a neighborhood where, like, I... Like, I would just go outside, and there'd be, like, a group of kids that I could, like, hang out with. And it wasn't even, like, we were best friends, but it was, like, my mom would just be, like, yeah, like, you can go hang out with them, whatever. And we would just, like, go by the lake and, like, whatever. And it's so awkward being an adult, because you can't, like, if there's, like, a group of people, you're not going to just go over there and be, like, hey, hey, everybody. Or at least I'm not. Like, people that can do that is, that's impressive. I could never do that. Mostly alcoholics at bars. I feel, yeah, I think <laughs> that's very much like uh, I'm on my fifth drink and mm -hmm. I'm at this bar every day. Like, hey, how's it going? Like, I know everybody here except you. Like, yeah, <laughs> tell me what your story is. <laughs> yeah, I definitely used to like use alcohol, not in like an excessive way, but if I was at like a show or something, whether it was comedy or music, like I would get really bad social anxiety and I would feel like I couldn't talk to them because they were so talented and I would have like a drink. And then once I had a drink, I was like, okay, now I can talk to them. But without it, I was like, like, I've gotten better with that over the years because you can't rely on that. Not healthy. But at the time, yeah, like I needed to have a drink in, in order to even like introduce myself. I was like so weird. Oh, yeah. I think I'm like just getting to the point in my life where I just don't think alcohol has any value to me it, whatsoever. Honestly, it doesn't. Which like that's addictive substances in general, I guess, is yeah. like after a certain point, like you're going to realize that it's never going to hit you the same way as like when you were first drinking in college mm -hmm. and like having all your fun times. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think now, like, I can tell that I'm getting older because my, like, the way I value alcohol is, like, I'm really into food and, like, cooking and recipes. So if there's, like, a certain beer or wine that pairs really well with, like, a certain dish, then I'm like, ooh, like, I need to have that. That's, like, where I'm at with alcohol. I'm, I'm so, like, I, I don't even think I've had liquor other than maybe, like, a sip of a friend's drink or something in years. Like, I only do beer and wine, if that yeah. It's just not good. It's not really yeah. worth it. And it sucks now because, like, I used to be able to drink so much more than I could drink now. 
and now yeah. I'm just like, oh, I'm gonna have a few beers, and then it's like terrible. My stomach is just like, I, why did you put all this stuff in here? We don't know how to tolerate this. We don't know what to do with this. Like, yeah. I don't even get, like, mentally drunk. I just get, like, stomach Bloated. sick and drunk, and then I'm like, uh, like, I don't feel good, and then I don't sleep the next day. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of nightlife around here, and, like, right before quarantine, I went out a little bit more just because I can literally walk to really nice places, but it's like... I, like when I see people doing shots I feel like 50 years old I'm like what the fuck Like that's insane to me <laughs> Like I would never Like I, I don't think I will ever do that again Like but I probably Like I don't even know how long it's been Since I did something like that That's crazy to me <laughs> Well it's all about the event It's all about the activity And the camaraderie of putting right. poison into your body <laughs> <laughs> well, we should probably get back to movies. Yeah, I guess so. We could also take a quick break. Okay. Because we are getting close to an hour. Get your snack. Here's your capitalism. Skip it if you want to. <laughs> wow, we're back. We're we just, back. We just spent the last uh, 20 minutes sanitizing ourselves. Mm-hmm. Um, I've just swallowed bleach. Um, so this may yeah. be our last podcast. It was awkward because um, Jordan and I have never seen each other naked before, but we had to fully strip down and jump into the vat of hand sanitizer that I have. I purchased it from all seven continents and poured it into a giant human-sized vat, so that's what I require of my guests. So it was a little awkward, but I'm glad that we got that out of the way. I'm also very orange right now because I've been tanning under UV light. Yeah. Because I hear that also helps destroying the virus. Well, anyone smart does these things on a daily basis. Oh, you have to. You have yeah. to keep in touch with your personal hygiene over COVID. Mm-hmm. Uh, so movies are happening. Yes. They've happened. We've only really talked about The King of Staten Island so far. So I feel like we're going to get into a lightning round of movies right now. Uh, is there anything specific you want to talk about first? As well, we go into the second half. I also watched this movie on Hulu, Shirley. Oh, I didn't know that was on Hulu. It is. With Ooh. Elizabeth Moss, um, who's amazing. It wasn't my favorite movie. I love weird indie movies, but I just didn't feel like this one was really focused in the way that I wanted it. Like, if you're going to watch a powerhouse Elizabeth Moss indie performance, I would go with Her Smell. Um, I saw that oh, yeah. I saw that earlier this year. It didn't come out during quarantine, but she's killer in that, and I think that's a much better... Like, I think that communicates a message and shows that character in a, in a uh, certain framework that I preferred. Um, but Michael Stuhlbarg is also in Shirley. He's so good. And uh, it was interesting. Weird little movie. Like, I, it's not something I would recommend to everyone, but still happy that that kind of stuff is getting made and that someone like Elizabeth Moss is turning into a bigger star, someone who... She was the star of the last film I saw before going into quarantine. Invisible Man. Invisible Man, yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's a good That's a good thing I am um, to talk about. The last film I saw in the theater before quarantine was The Way Back with Ben Affleck, the basketball alcoholism movie. <laughs> was it worth it? It was good. Honestly, like, that week, um, that last week before quarantine you probably shouldn't have been going to a movie theater when um we went to my mom and I went to see it and um there was only like one or two other people in the whole cinema and it was like a big AMC theater so I'm sure it was fine I mean we didn't get sick but um at the time there were already people like quarantining and there were already people that were like it was like March 13th or something like that there were already people that were like don't go to the movies but I'm glad we caught that last one and and honestly that movie was better than I thought like uh, there there's a very typical type of ending of those type of movies and they didn't do that I really liked the way that they ended it it was like it was like resolution but also not a perfect like Hollywood ending it was very real and I tend to like Ben Affleck I mean I know people are like annoyed by him these days but I like him so he was good. It was a good movie, you know, it's like, especially if you like basketball. And it's not like a heavy basketball movie, but the themes, like especially people that I think really love basketball and kind of consider it more like a religion than a sport would probably enjoy that. Because it's called The Way Back because him using basketball is kind of like the way back to, you know, life after isolating and being an alcoholic. So, Speaking of basketball movies... If you guys do subscribe to Criterion Channel, 
they have Lenny Cook on there, which is the Safdie Brothers documentary about Lenny Cook. And it is amazing. Ooh, I haven't seen that. Uh, yes, highly recommend for any basketball fans. If I eventually do a Criterion episode with Brendan, um, we'll definitely talk about that film. But that we was need to have Brendan films. as a guest. Oh, yeah. He's our fave guest. And also, Rita. if anybody's at home and they want to Zoom in, they want to uh, FaceTime in, they want to uh, come to the backyard. Do it. Do it. We'll have some guests on if you guys have any theme episodes that you guys want to do. Um we definitely want to do streaming guides. But, yeah, maybe we'll do a whole basketball episode. That would be badass. I love basketball. <laughs> yeah. But definitely, if you're a basketball fan, you need to watch Lenny Cook, like, immediately. I'm going to watch it. Best, yeah, that's the best basketball documentary I've ever seen. Especially for our time. And, like, it's very cool to watch this documentary because it features heavily Carmelo Anthony and LeBron alongside of Lenny Cook as, Aww. like, other characters in this documentary. So it's, like, it's very cool to see. Yeah. There's, like, Kobe footage, too. I've seen both of those men. Well, not Kobe, but I've seen Melo and LeBron play. Just want to say that. I think I have, too. An important experience. I think so. I saw LeBron play um, against the Bulls in Chicago, which was really cool. And also Patrick Ewing was there. Now that I think about it, I can't pinpoint when I've seen LeBron play. I wonder if I've actually seen him play. Maybe you were just such good friends that you're starting to retain some of my memories, even though Jordan wasn't there. It was before I knew Jordan. <laughs> I've, just seen, I've seen a lot of basketball games. A lot of basketball games. My dad had tickets to the Nets, like, when they were really bad. Like, nose, <laughs> nosebleeds, like, $2 tickets. Like, when the Nets, they couldn't give away Nets tickets. So, like, I probably saw a lot of random people during the days of now where I live, across the train tracks from East Rutherford, the Meadowlands. I have to pick up this call, so. Oh, okay. <laughs> we'll pause. Hello? That was just Spike Lee on the phone telling us that we need to talk about his damn film. Spike, you know, we do things in our order that we do them, and, like, you're not the boss of me. I tell him that every time. Every time I see him. But it was good, Spike. Thank I loved for, it. Thank you for making The Five Bloods. Um, I liked it a lot better than Black Klansman, actually. Interesting. Mm -hmm. I definitely didn't know what to expect from it. Um, I think he chose an interesting style, as Spike Lee always does. Uh, I don't know if it was my favorite Spike Lee. Uh, I feel like there were parts of the film that... It felt so tonally right, and it felt so good, and then there were other parts of the films where I was just like, oh, really? Like, this is the bit you're going to go with right now? Yeah, there are some parts that lost me a little bit, but I think overall, like, obviously there are so few war movies that come from the perspective of a black man. Yeah. And I just thought it was fascinating, like, to think about all of the people whose stories are not told. And the fact that he was able to do so much serious stuff, like the one the one soldier that had major PTSD and um, all the other stuff they touched on, the, the male friendship, like, you know, I just thought it was, like, to me it was just really illuminating because I just don't see stuff like that. And I also thought it was paced really well. Like, I liked, like, I was into it. There, there were even moments that weren't my favorite. I was, like, into it the whole time, and I was, like, there with them. And, you know, when certain not to do spoilers, but when certain things happened, I was genuinely, like, like I gasped, like, a couple times, and I was very into it. It was good. Like, I definitely felt like there were definitely, like, deer hunter vibes at times, mm -hmm. which, uh, I enjoyed that homage. Yeah. And I felt like all of the serious stuff in the film, I really enjoyed a lot. Me too. Yeah. I, I love that the bar also was called Apocalypse Now. Apparently that's a real bar in Vietnam. Oh, wow. <laughs> It was very cool also to see the generational effects of, like, war. Yeah. Because I don't think we talk about that enough because we kind of just glorify everybody who served and then move on from it. And then we don't talk about, like, what actually happens and, like, whether or not we should continue doing this. Yeah. It was also great to see, I feel like, the actors, um, with the exception of, of Chadwick, I feel like the older actors, many of them are guys that you see playing, you know, the bellhop or the, you know, friend at the party or something and, you know, 
Hollywood has consistently just given these, you know, sidelined roles to these guys, and they finally got to have a meaty part in a really good, well thought out movie, which is awesome. Yeah, uh, I thought the performances were pretty good all around. Yeah. Very compelling performances. Yeah, it's kind of like what I was saying before. Like, that's the train. I live right next to the train station. If anyone is curious on how to find me, feel free because I need friends. Um, (laughs) (laughs) uh, Yeah, so, like, again, that's, I mean, I've never thought about, really, maybe briefly seeing an article here or there, um, but, like, I've never really thought about what it was like to be a black person in Vietnam and having to deal with all of the things they have to deal with on a regular basis anyway with racism and then on top of it having PTSD and having, you know, these issues stemming from losing their friend at war. And I also really like that they didn't have younger guys playing, they didn't have separate actors playing the guys in the other scenes. I like that because even though they didn't look like they were 20 or however old they were supposed to be, for me I was able to suspend my disbelief enough that I was just like, for me it's better that it's them rather than all new actors, you know? Do you think they wanted the Martin Scorsese aging software and didn't get the budget? Actually, I think that's true. I think that um, I did see an article about that, that um, Spike Lee had to fight for the budget that he got, which was much, much less than the Irishman. I think the Irishman's budget was like $175 million. Shout out, Marty. Love you. Um, but of course, they just they gave that to him. And, um, you know, I now mean, we're boycotting Netflix because of their racism. Oh, my God. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, but overall, I, I really, really enjoyed that film. Yeah, no, it was a good <laughs> film. Uh, and I thought that, yeah. It was definitely, it definitely adds to the Spike Lee library, which, like, when you think of Spike Lee, you think of everything that he's ever done. Mm-hmm. You know, it's not just about one movie, because if you're just looking at one movie, then you're missing out unlike a lot of other compelling things that he's done. Yeah, I agree. Uh, We touched on basketball a little bit earlier, but, like, since we're talking about Spike Lee, should we talk about The Last Dance at all? The ESPN documentary. so good. (laughs) I mean, what is there to say that hasn't been said, but... This this is true. (laughs) Just watch it, I guess, if you haven't watched it, and you have ESPN access. That was, like, the only sports going on in the world for the beginning of quarantine. I'm always down to engage in a Michael Jordan conversation. I think the tough thing is, like, getting around the boring parts of Michael Jordan that you, like, have to talk about. (laughs) Because there were definitely, like, more interesting parts of the story. Yeah. And, like, more crazy things. I just loved his, like, that he's still, like, pissed off about stuff. Like, because you just think of him as, I mean, he's one of those rare people that reaches a stratosphere of fame that makes him, like, not a person. You know what I mean? Like, somebody like him or, like, you know, Michael Jackson or somebody like that that's just so, it's like, their their success is so overwhelming and they're, like, overall, I mean, obviously, like, Michael Jackson's more controversial figure, but, like, anyone who reaches that kind of stratosphere, it's just kind of, like... You don't even like you just don't think of them as people sometimes and I just loved that the way they interviewed him like he was just like this guy that was talking about this stuff that happened 20 years ago and how he was like that was not okay like when this happened or whatever like it was just so I just I mean I loved it and also like that period of history with the Bulls being so iconic and completely transcending sports like people that were not into basketball knew the Bulls and like everyone knew the 96 Bulls team and like you know what I mean like it was just it was pop culture and to just have something that broke it down so deep in such a detailed way was fascinating because it's one of those things that from the 90s like since I grew up in the 90s I always think I know about things, but then I realize that I didn't, I don't really know about them because I was so young. Yeah. Same thing with when I watched, um, the, that, that Monica Lewinsky documentary that was on, I think Lifetime, it was a 10 part series. I think it was called the Lewinsky affair. It was the first time that she was interviewed and she like told her side of the story, like from beginning to end in detail. And I was like, Oh shit. Like I thought I knew this story, but I really didn't know this story. And um, I, I, like I, I, the same thing with this, like just the, the minutia and all the details of, um, all the dynamics of the team and all that kind of stuff. Like it was just, it was fascinating. Yeah. And you think about how fast things change in the world now 
and like how quickly like people like dynasties are ended Mm -hmm. and it's like they really just ended because he left like (laughs) (laughs) that's like really it right yeah (laughs) and I still think Space Jam is the most iconic movie of all time like I will always watch it when it comes on no matter what yeah it's also good because that documentary also helped to legalize sports gambling because everybody was like oh the greatest sports figure of all time loves gambling it's so fucking ridiculous <laughs> that 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 gambling is like people are arrested for gambling like there has to be illegal gambling rings like are you kidding me like go, can't you go find terrorists like i'm bored <laughs> anyway have you seen um this is another movie that was supposed to come out and was uh diverted to vod well netflix um did you see the lovebirds i did what did you think I enjoyed it because of the New Orleans aspect of it. Yeah. It definitely gave me some nostalgia in that regard. Um, I'm also a fan of both of them. Yes. Issa Rae and Camille Nanjiani. I love them. Um, So that was really enjoyable for me to just get to watch them in a movie. Did you see the um, the, uh, Steve Carell, Tina Fey movie Date Night? No. So I... I would not have watched it for those characters, but I feel like Issa Rae and Camille Nanjiani, I would watch it. <laughs> yeah, so this movie, like, I I like, I like posted about it and everything at the time because I think people really, like, there needs to be more black and brown people in these movies, especially romantic comedy type of movies and stuff. There needs to be more mixed couples, all that kind of stuff. So, like, I think that everybody should watch it, but... The plot of this movie is almost exactly the same as Date Night, and it bums me out that the writers didn't, and the director didn't give them a better, I mean, these are two really talented people, too, like, this is not just, like, two, like, good-looking people or something that were put in this movie, like, they're really talented and skilled with comedy, and I also don't really like, um, this, this new trend of comedies that need to have, like, action and crime in them. Like, it's a really common thing now. There's not just, like, a... Co- like, like it's probably the end of that, though. I hope so. It's just... Why does... It, it's, like, rather than actual jokes, it's, like, oh, my God, this this new crazy thing just happened, and, like, it's funny because it's insane that we're dealing with it, but, like, there's not an actual joke there. Like, my favorite scenes with them were the ones where they were just kind of, like, talking or, like, bickering or bantering off of each other rather than, like, the big action, and, oh, my God, someone just got shot, and, oh, my... Like, that kind of stuff, I'm just... and. And literally, the movie Date Night has almost the exact same plot. Like, it's actually kind of annoying that the writers couldn't do something else. Like a Greta and Boss situation? Yeah, it just feels like they wasted Kumail and Issa, who are, like, crazy talented people. So, I'm hoping that there's better writing out there for people of color, not just roles. But then again, it's like... Did you watch The Photograph? Did that come out? Yes. How was that? I loved The Photograph. I paid for it. Wow, I don't know what it's on. But, um, you know, the photograph is amazing. Literally blows... I mean, it, you can't even compare it to Lovebirds. It's totally different. But, um, no, that movie, I think, is phenomenal. I actually, when I was posting about that movie, I put that I recommend it to everyone because I genuinely don't know who couldn't get something out of this movie. There's, like, the love story aspect of it, but it also deals with identity and family, and they go... They go in between, so it's like Lakeith Stanfeld, your boyfriend, and um, Issa Rae, and they are like meeting and falling for each other, but it's like, it's done in this beautiful way, the cinematography is amazing. The, the way that they get together and like fall for each other is really natural and not forced, it's not um, like overly romantic-y or, or um, Hollywood at all, it's like so real. And the they juxtapose that with... Um, well, I won't get into too much. I don't want to give it away because it's so cool. But like, and but like, they juxtapose it with a with a story from another time that's related to the the current day story, and it's just that that completely. I felt like that kind of stole the show, um, but it's just great. And I, I highly re- watch the photograph that that I would watch over Lovebirds. But I also feel like people just need to turn that movie on because basically, like Netflix needs to order more movies with black and brown leads especially if it's an interracial couple and especially if it's something that like you know like it's a great example that this movie is the same as that movie date night because 10 years ago they would cast two established comedian white people in it 
And this time, instead, they cast a, a Pakistani and African American woman. Steve Carell needs to chill. Also, I love him, but yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, he's in everything. He's in a lot. Yeah, like I guess like some people are really into that still. It's just like a lot. Yeah. No, he works like, all the time. Space Force is just like. Was this really... I guess it's necessary, but, like, was it really necessary to have, like, <laughs> this much of a budget on a comedy that's not that funny? Well, you know what I love that is it's kind of polarizing. A lot of people don't like the show, but I love The Morning Show. Have you seen that? It's on Apple TV+. Plus. It's, um, it's based on the true story of Matt Lauer and Ann Curry on um, The Today Show, and it has Jennifer Aniston and Steve Carell and Reese Witherspoon. It's Oh, and Billy Crudup is in it. He's great in it. It's a really good... Like, it can sometimes be over the top and too dramatized, and they deal with a lot of real events. So I think there's some people that just think it's, like, too much. But it's such a good show. I think it's fantastic. And Steve Carell plays um, a Me Too kind of figure, and he is utterly repulsive, and it's just... He's so good in it. He's so good at playing that character. And... He has this really complex relationship with his co-star, Jennifer Aniston. So, like, it's one of those situations where the whole world is turning on this guy because because he got accused of sexual assault. And publicly, she won't support him. But they have meetings in private because it's complicated. She's had a 25-year friendship with this guy, and they've yeah. had flirtations at times. And they kind of thought, maybe we would be together at some point. And so, even though she understands and knows that this is true about him she she's not just cutting him off and never seeing him again which i think is like now in culture it's so like if someone's accused of that they're canceled forget about it i'm never talking to them but there's a lot of complexity in between that if you know a person personally so it's like the way they did that i thought was really good so i i'm 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 still into steve carell but i see your point too <laughs> yeah it's just excessive at times. That man is making so much money. Oh, my God. Yeah. And, yeah. I don't need to trash talk Steve Carell. Cause Steve, come on our podcast. We'd love to talk to you. How do you feel about... yourself. Yeah, how do you feel about your overwhelming schedule? Do you ever see your family? What's going on? Do you think you peaked 20 years ago? Oh. No, not 20 no, years no, ago. No, 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 no. 10 years ago. Well, maybe there's, um, there's a, a peak still to come with Steve Carell. We'll see. Yeah, but at this point, I don't really care. He's making so much money. <laughs> He's making so much money right now. Well, that's what I love about you is you're kind of all about the new next thing. Like, you yeah. love, like, like you're someone who, like, I'll kind of dig my heels in about, like, classic stuff, and you'll just be like, no, like, this is the future. <laughs> so it's like, I feel like our podcast is, like, a good balance of that. Yes, for sure. So what else new stuff have you streamed? Um, is there anything on this list that... Oh, I guess we should talk about Hamilton as well. My favorite thing in the world. <laughs> I watch it every day. Uh, uh, have you watched it? Yeah, I watched it. You uh, did? It was the first time I've seen it also. Really? Had you listened to the music before? No, not really. I've only heard like bits and pieces wow. of stuff like out of context, like just people being like, I love Hamilton. Yeah. Um, I have walked dogs around where Hamilton was killed. Oh we my god, we all in. So I guess that's that's my one fact about Hamilton. Yeah, I shouldn't even we shouldn't get into it too much cuz I will talk about Hamilton for 3 hours, but I love it. I mean, I don't I just don't know what else to say. It's one it of my favorite. It was very well things. shot. Also. Oh, it's so well shot. Like everybody it's so will talk cool. about how great it was musically and all that stuff. But the director taught like Tommy did a really good job. He the the way that you can see it from a different perspective that you could ever see in the actual Rogers, Richard Rogers Theater is amazing. I love the overhead shots. Like, you never see that with Broadway. It's just so cool. Yes. I, I definitely enjoyed how it was shot. The music was really good. Obviously, there's a lot of internet hate towards Lin-Manuel Lin Miranda. Oh, my God. I will literally point. defend Lin-Manuel. Like, I would go to a duel for him. The issue is just he's very cheesy. He's just a very cheesy person to be front and center of this. Like, I feel I like know, he should have just written it. it and then just been like, yep, that's my work. I'm going to step away. Well, but he's been very cheesy since it. <laughs> I don't, well, I don't agree, though, because, like, the reason that he wrote In the Heights, which was his, if anyone doesn't know, that was his first musical um, on Broadway. He actually won the Tony for Best Musical. Um, 
like he grew up loving musical theater, but he thought, you know, what am I going to be in besides West Side Story? Like, what are what roles are there for me? Really, barely anything. And so, I don't blame him for putting himself in it. Like, I know that some people find it narcissistic, like that he wrote this whole thing and had to play the lead role. But I really don't, especially as an actress. I'm like. Dude, you have to create your own opportunities. And if your opportunity that you're creating is is Hamilton, I mean, you deserve to star in it. Like, I can't, I still can't believe that he wrote that. The musical's almost three hours. Like, he wrote the entire lyrics and music himself. No, no, no. It's really, it's like, really astounding and what? crazy. It's like. And I still, like, I've been a fan of it for a long time. Like, I've listened to the soundtrack for years. And there are still things that with every viewing, I catch something new. And I'm like, oh, shit, he's referencing, like, this document. Or he's referencing that person. Or, oh, I I know what this line means. Whereas before I, like, how did I not catch that before? But it's so dense. There's so much in it that it's just, I, I can't, it's unbelievable. Like, what he's just such a genius. I love him. I think I have to marry a composer. Like, I really don't see any way around that. <laughs> I really don't. It's like, if I came home, and I mean, it has to be, like, an artistic person, but if I came home and, like, you know, I was married to someone who was talking about, like, corporate business spreadsheets or something, or whatever those guys talk about, like, I would just be like, can you compose a song? Like, why aren't you composing a song? You know? <laughs> like, I just can't. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> well. Watch Hamilton if you haven't. It's completely unique. You uh, definitely have to watch it one time. Oh, yeah. And it's so amazing that it's so accessible now. Like, it's, you know, as someone who lives minutes away from Broadway, it still wasn't very accessible. It was really hard. I won the Hamilton lottery, actually, and when I went to pick up the ticket... I walked up and people applauded because the Hamilton lottery is so hard to win. It's like winning the actual lottery. Everyone was like, congratulations. Like, like it's a big deal to win that lottery. And like now that anyone in the world can just watch it at any time, as long as they have Disney plus, of course, uh, is, is amazing. Like it's going to change lives. It's going to save lives of young kids that love musical theater and don't know their place in the world yet. And could never get to see Hamilton otherwise, because they're never going to afford a ticket to New York. And then a very, very, very expensive ticket to see it. So like, it's amazing that it's just, it's just there. Like you just have it now and you can, like I've been rewinding it and examining it and watching it over and over. And it's just amazing. Cause like normally if you do get a ticket and you do get in the room where it happens, like you have to savor every moment cause it's ending, ending, ending every second. But now you can rewind it. It's like for theater, like for <laughs> theater people, this is like, this is like the Super Bowl and the Oscars and like the moon landing all in one day. Like it's, I'm going to stop, but um, just watch it. <laughs> Speaking of all in one day, should we move on to our feature movie? Palm Springs? I think so. All right. Um, what do you think? I, I enjoyed it a lot more than I thought I was going to enjoy it. It was good. Definitely, like, the only marketing I've heard about it has basically been that it's Groundhog day E. Yeah. Like, they just use that device, kind of. Mm -hmm. And that's basically all I knew about it and didn't really want to know anything else about it, mm -hmm. which I'm glad that I did not dig any deeper because yeah. I probably would have liked it less if I knew more about it. <laughs> Same. I didn't know anything about it, really. It was just, like, I kept seeing people tweet about it, and they were just like, this is the best movie I've seen all year, or, like, this is such a unique movie, you have to watch it. And so I went in blind, too. I did not know that it was going to be the repetitive uh, time loop that it was. <laughs> Yeah, I think uh, Andy Sandberg definitely used it well, mm -hmm. I would say. He was great in it. I really yeah. liked him in it. Yeah, I think this is definitely one of my favorite things that The Lonely Island has done. Like, mm -hmm. I think the Bash Bros thing was fine, but, like, even as a baseball fan, it was, like, a little bit cheesy. I didn't see it. Um, it was good. Like, it was well-produced and everything. It was just, like, very over the top. Like, they have a lot of money behind their productions now. Mm -hmm. So, like, a lot of the times, like, I feel like the production value is higher than the comedy in a lot of comedies that are made in Hollywood now. Mm -hmm. It's because people care about it looking like it's a Hollywood film more than they care about making people laugh. Yeah. Um, but I also, I really liked the cinematography in Palm Springs. Like, I thought it was oh, yeah. well shot. I really liked it. It was visually appealing, for sure. No, it was, like, very minimalist in the fact that it showed off Palm Springs which mm -hmm. is very much the point of it and like 
we don't live in LA, but like if you live in LA, I'm sure that you've probably been to a lot of events or went on vacation in Palm Springs. Like I have family members and friends who go vacation in Palm Springs. It's a very yeah. like, gay area. It's a very like hip place to go. Mm-hmm. Uh, people kind of going out to the desert and having a good time. Mm-hmm. And I feel like deserts have kind of become like this psychedelic experience in the minds of Americans just because of like the idea of like Burning Man and stuff like that and just Mm -hmm. like everybody goes out to Joshua Tree in California and just like those ideas and like these places that are just so like algorithmically algorithmically like forcing people to go to them Mm -hmm. (laughs) like for whatever reason (laughs) just because they have so many like pop-up businesses uh, and stuff like that Mm -hmm. Like, I feel like Palm Springs is kind of like, oh, yeah, this is just your life. Like, you just wake up and you do the same thing every day. You just find the next thing in this weird desert. Mm -hmm. I thought, like, I love anything that's kind of like what is reality and, like, anything that plays with time, anything that plays with, like, memory or, um, like, anything that's, like, what is the point of it all. Like, I love that kind of stuff. And I thought there's a scene toward the end. Um, I'm not going to get too spoilery, but, like, Basically, she's saying to him, like, I need to go and do this. Like, are you going to do it with me? And he's like, no, I just want to stay. Like, I just want to keep things how they are. And that is, like, the biggest problem in so many personal relationships. <laughs> it's like, are you, I'm going to go over here. Are you going to come with me? And the person's like, nope, I'm going to stay right here. And it's like, well, if we need to grow together. Like, would you like to grow with me and, like, move on to the next thing? Or do you want to keep doing everything the same and sometimes that person saying I'm gonna go relents and says okay I'll stay in the comfort space with you and sometimes the person who is the, is in the comfort space wants to change and go outside of the comfort space but when you're in that place where you're you're feeling completely different things and you want to do different things with your life and it's like I just thought that that scene where they get into that, I was like, oh my God, like this is just such a good metaphor. And the way that they're using like a time loop to express that was really smart. Yeah, it definitely got deeper as we went further. Mm -hmm. And it was definitely satisfying for me at this point in my life as a 25 year old man. Yeah. Um, (laughs) There were very much uh, themes that I related to. And just like. Yeah, it's just very interesting. Also, stuff that we talked about earlier in the podcast, thematically about, like, where our culture is as a society. Mm -hmm. And it's like, if you make a mistake, should you live with this every day for the rest of your life kind of a thing? Yeah. (laughs) Uh, And, like, how much does somebody deserve to, like, live with a mistake that they make? Which I feel like it doesn't necessarily answer in the film Mm -hmm. concurrently or, like, conclusively. But I think that is a very interesting topic that they start to talk about that, like, a lot of movies have just been like, I'm not going there. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Uh, Because that's the thing. I think, like, a lot of people think that mistakes happen in a vacuum and the people who commit those mistakes aren't affected by them. Mm -hmm. Uh, But, like, if you're a human being, like, you should be affected by them. And I guess that's kind of the place where we're at is, like are the celebrities who commit mistakes like human beings anymore who actually care about other humans? Yeah. Or are they not human beings anymore where they actually feel guilt about horrific things that they do? And just, like, capitalism in general at this point, like, are you willing to give up a little bit of money so that people don't get killed as much? Or, like, are you able to give up a little bit of money so that... Uh, people have better health care. Are you willing to give up a little bit more of your money so that uh, people have better schools? And, mm-hmm. like, a lot of people are too greedy, and they just look at themselves, and they're like, I am living my singular life, and then once this is over, I am gone, mm-hmm. and there's nothing left on this earth because I am gone. Yeah. But, like, when it comes down to it, there's so many people in the world, and, like, are we interacting with people to, like have connections and like further the human race and like add to culture and like add to who we are or are we just living in the world to become the top of the world and like Mm -hmm. rule the world and like take over and be an asshole to people and do whatever we want because we know that what happens tomorrow is the same thing that happens every day or do we live every day living it like oh I'm going to change who I am because yeah. I could be a better person because that is what humanity is about is bettering yourself and being a better person. Yeah, and I think there's a real message in there about like choices and how um, 
even if you think that you're stuck in a certain situation and you really are just like, you're like, because the way that he was like, I know everything about this time loop. We cannot do this. Like you're wasting your time. If you try to do that, that these are the rules, like, and nothing matters. So I'm just going to kick back and do what I do and stuff. And she was just like, no, like I need to find a way to stop this, that there are so many people that, and I, I've experienced this recently, actually, like people that are just like nope like I know what's best for me and I know what I'm doing and that's it and I'm not considering any other option and it's it's really important I think that people come into your life that can tell you like no like you actually have a choice like you actually can take action here and it might completely fail but who knows what you'll find on the way even if you like it's it's like that saying um shoot for the moon if you miss you'll still land among the stars it's like you don't know what's going to happen if you try something. You do know what's going to happen if you don't try something, then you're just going to stay in the same place. But you can at least try to break out of that. And, like, even coming down to, like, when he tells her, don't follow me in here, and she does it anyway, like, that was a choice that she made that changed her entire existence. And, like... Do we want to go into spoilers? Yeah, let's go to spoilers. Um, spoilers! Spoilers! spoilers. <laughs> wow. Uh, spoilers for Palm Springs. So turn it off. If you haven't watched it, go watch it. It's great. Um, no, but I, I was definitely going to say, like, when she walks into the cave, like, I don't know how much that's spoiling, but yeah, I, I do think that was, like, I was definitely pissed off at that device because I was just like, why would you walk into the cave? Like, <laughs> but I guess that's also what makes a good film is, like, having people pissed off at the screen. Yeah. Well, I think it showed that she was a good person, like, because especially when you find out that she had slept with her sister's husband, obviously that's, like, a horrible, yeah. horrible thing to do, and, like, the fact that she cared so much about this person that she just met that day, um, at least in this time, at least in that, that parallel, that part of the universe, she had met him for the first time that day, um, that she cared enough about him to, like, follow him into the cave and make sure that he was okay, even though he was saying, don't follow me, you know, I, I like the way that that, you know, they don't really shove that down your throat or anything, but I just love when movies, like, put little things in there about characters where you can be like, oh, well, you know, this person does care, it's just that they went through they're, they have this like really tough like she had that like really tough dynamic with her family where it was like her sister was perfect but she was like the fuck up and like I think a lot of people when they're treated that way they just kind of like fall into it deeper they're like okay if I'm the fuck up if, that, if that's what you think then I'm gonna be the fuck up I'm gonna, I'm gonna be the biggest fuck up in the world that I'm gonna do something like terrible that is true yeah. I think also that is uh, a mark of our time too and like watching reality TV constantly is just like people feel like if they are not like comfortable that they need to act up to the extreme now just mm -hmm. because like we watch it on tv all the time like there's no just being like oh yeah like you're bothering me how you're acting like this like people fight for conflict sometimes mm -hmm. uh and i guess like the the movie puts in perspective like i like the fact that the andy sandberg character like Decided to meet everybody at the wedding <laughs> Because like I yeah. think about that all the time Like what if I just didn't talk to the people I talked to today Like what if I just decided to choose other people mm -hmm. And like it changes your life and your outlook so much Like the Ray scenario mm -hmm. With the J.K. Simmons character Hunting him down It was just like I like that character. And I thought that scene at the end was really good. Compelling, yeah. Like, how... Because I think a lot of people, like... I, I'm not saying that she would want to live the same day over again, but my mom will literally cry if she talks about this time when I was, like, growing up. I think I was, like, six. And, like, her and my dad were, like, in a good place, and they weren't, like, separated. And, like... Um, and... Oh, here's my dad, actually. Let's pause. <laughs> <laughs> I summoned him. <laughs> All right, we are interrupted, but we were talking about the scene toward the end of Palm Springs with J.K. Simmons, and I was talking about how there was this time, like, when I was a kid that my dad rented a beach house in my mom's, like, favorite place, and um, we, like, had a beach house 
for like a week and we invited like everybody in the family and like things were good and there wasn't like as much drama and there were people around that have since passed away that were there at the time and it was just like an idyllic like week of my mom's life and if you bring it up she'll like start crying about it because it was so amazing and I feel like if she had to live in a time loop like she would a hundred percent pick that and so I feel like the way that J.K. Simmons was talking about that, like, he was saying he used to be so angry because, you know, he's never going to see his kids grow up and everything, but, like, he basically has a really nice life, and so this this day that he's reliving forever is not the worst-case scenario, really, and I guess that's why he's not still going after <laughs> Andy Samberg's character. I just thought that was, like, a really good point because I think there are a lot of people in the world that there are certain things they really wouldn't mind being on a loop during. Yeah, I think just so many people, especially, like, now, during these times that we're living in, like, nothing is guaranteed in any sense of the word. Like, I don't think anybody in America feels stable unless you're, like, rolling in the cash. But, like... Yeah. (laughs) Uh... It definitely says something about, like, being able to get to the point of a stable family and being able to stay in that moment because it is so hard to keep a stable family and keep it in that sense. Mm Because, as we see, everything changes once something happens. Like, we are living and breathing and feeling human beings who have memories and our memories make us have emotions towards things afterwards and that's how you remember stuff is how you relate it to an emotion Mm -hmm. so like if something bad happens to you you're always going to think about that bad thing and have emotions tied to it and remember that bad thing that happened to you and it's very hard to move forward from that Mm -hmm. and like it literally takes you living many many days of doing something else and actively trying not to think about that thing to stop thinking about that thing (laughs) yeah It's really hard. Like, I've noticed that in quarantine, too, like, certain things that went down in my life before that I think I was just kind of, like, with my very busy schedule and, like, like, I was really, especially right before quarantine, like, I was working hard and playing hard. Like, I literally, like, was nonstop. And I think there was a lot of things that I was running from because I didn't want to sit and think about them. And then quarantine, like, I was just forced to sit and think about them all the time. And it's... It's just a, like it's just so timely that they're living the same day over and over because I don't even know what time is anymore. Like it's so weird that I haven't seen you in four months and I used to see you all the time and like I'm like what happened? Like I don't like I don't it's this it's July like what? It's the it's the craziest thing also and kind of like how generationally we've changed the way of life. That, like, it used to be, like, oh, every day is exactly the same. You just hang out with your family, you have a nice dinner, you go in your pool, Mm -hmm. and you go to bed. Yeah, and that's enough. And now, so many things have to happen or else we don't feel like the day is happening. (laughs) We need to fight our neighbor. We need to, like, break up with our spouse. We need to, like, (laughs) crash our car into somebody or else we don't feel like we've achieved enough in a day because we have 24-hour news cycles. We're watching drama on TV constantly. We're reading the newspapers. We're, like, on Twitter going through. We're watching people fight on Facebook who we've never met before or met once in our lives. Mm -hmm. Like... Everybody has just sped up so much, which, like, I think is definitely, like, on the part of, like, the wealthiest people being, like, I'm going to die one day. I need to fit as much as possible into my life, Mm -hmm. and I need to be able to fly a jet and go to Palm Springs and, like, live lavishly and then also do this thing and do this thing and do this thing and go to this place and go to this place and go to this place. Mm -hmm. And then it's, like, that's what's projected out into the world because that sells products. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But in reality, like... Nobody's ever used products that much And went to this many places And like experienced this many things Mm -hmm. We're just like marketing By using social media like Oh spend more money go more places Like do these things like This is just how you're supposed to live now When in reality like people used to do One special thing like a month And now (laughs) if we don't do a special thing for a week We're like oh my gosh it's so hard to live Like I haven't done anything fun Like it's the weekend and it's like Mm -hmm. People used to just not do shit for, like, months at a time, and they would do one thing. Yeah. (laughs) And there is something to be said for that, like, for that kind of life that he's living with his family by the pool. And, you know, like, yeah, he'll never get to see his kids grow up, which is tragic, but he will also never have to see his wife, you know, get sick and die or, or or him die and leave her behind, you know? Like, he'll always be in this 
moment of this like middle part of life which would drive me crazy but also like if I could just be content with that like the way that he eventually like who knows how many loops it took for him to stop attacking Andy Samberg and just kind of be in his backyard like you know when you're when you don't have to be held accountable you know and you like because when I'm watching the movie I'm thinking damn it would be really cool to like eat whatever I want every day and and not have to worry about gaining weight and like oh they can have sex and like they're not don't have to worry about pregnancy or STDs and the slate is wiped clean the next day or they can go do something like illegal and it's totally fine like but I feel like that would get old so fast because when you don't have to be held accountable and you don't have any rules and you just don't have any structure it's like there's no opportunity for rebellion like it doesn't feel it's like like if I'm you know trying to eat really healthy and then I eat something bad for me it's like fun you know what I mean it's like exciting if every day I'm eating something bad for me or I'm eating I'm eating a lot or whatever like by like the third or fourth day I'm like okay I feel gross and I am there's too much sugar in me and this is not fun anymore but like when you don't have those kind of rules you you know it that just like it just kind of ruins life ultimately yeah and it's obviously like meant to be a bigger metaphor for mortality in general (laughs) like they didn't they didn't beat us over the head with like how people talk about mortality and like just how it feels to like know that one day you're gonna going to die and like oh well like if you are put in a situation where you'll never actually die like would you pick that or would you possibly kill yourself at the end Mm -hmm. to see like if there is death and if there is another thing and i think that is also like a very interesting like philosophical point about humanity is kind of like yeah also like it is kind of profound that we die because like then we get to find out what happens on the other end and if there is nothing that happens on the other end that's just part of being a human you find out the great secret of Mm -hmm. like doing this but like do you ever is it are you meant to figure out all the secrets or are you meant to live happy and in ignorance yeah <laughs> and that's another like to loop it back to one of the first things i talked about which was six feet under there's like a famous line that was in like all the trailers for it and like on the award shows and stuff which was um this woman who lost a family member coming to one of the funeral directors played by peter krause and she's like crying and she's saying like why do people have to die and he's like to make life important and it's like if you don't if there's no risk of death which is something that i often see like on supernatural types of shows like where there's vampires or something like that it's like okay like there's no if anyone can just come back the next day and what like what's the drama like is there any drama is there any thrill in watching something there's no risk if a person can just come back it's like why you know it's kind of just like why do anything yeah (laughs) the fleeting nature of life the paradox of beauty yeah and it was also just a funny movie too like it was an enjoyable movie yeah no i uh, in a world where we probably don't need more movies made by white men this was definitely an okay movie mm-hmm. made by white <laughs> Definitely, like... There was that one black it, person. It def- yeah. <laughs> Who was also gay. Oh, good. <laughs> um, yeah. They definitely went above and beyond that it was a very unique film. <laughs> it did not feel like white mediocrity. <laughs> yeah. As a lot of films do mm-hmm. nowadays when we're watching comedies. Yeah. It, it'll, it'll definitely make you think about your own life and... How you want to spend your time do you want to just stay in a loop or do you want to break out of it yeah also it definitely says something about how the like white capitalist culture like defines our society mm-hmm. also <laughs> yeah. like that was a very pointed like thing about the movie like setting it at a wedding which is literally like let's spend all this money and like somebody's getting For married and we're paying a lot of money out of our pockets to go enjoy their wedding right now and mm-hmm. like we're gonna get drunk as hell because we're paying them a lot of money to go to their wedding yeah <laughs> and i spent a lot of money to pay for this hotel and go to this place like i'm gonna live it up and it's like, well, is it really worth it? Like, would you do this if you could do it all the time? Is it really worth it? Like, in general, like, do you feel really better about doing it? If yeah. you saw, like, at the end of going to this wedding ten times, which is, like, basically what you do with all of your friends, like, mm-hmm. is it really worth it? Like, do we really need these events to be so hyped up and, like, 
economic so burdens to be placed on families. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I see a lot of people still going through with their weddings during this pandemic. And I'm like, are you fucking like, I are you kidding me? Like, I can't even imagine. That's like unimaginable selfishness to me to be like, you all have to risk your lives because I'm getting married. It's like, can't you wait? I mean, even if I didn't care about other people, I, I wouldn't want to have my wedding, which is supposed to be a once in a lifetime thing with this hanging over everyone's head like even people that are like oh i'm not gonna catch that virus or whatever like still you gotta think about it if there's you know why would you want that hanging over your wedding it's like people are so intent they have to have this event that no matter what's happening they're still having it it's like why i also thought you know what other scenes (laughs) (laughs) you know you know what other scene was really profound when um she she runs over J.K. Simmons and um, she's like, it doesn't matter or whatever. And he's and Andy Samberg's like, no, like pain is real. Like you can't just like hurt people. It, that I thought was really interesting because like there's so much lack of accountability in this time loop. But it's like also in, in movies and television in general. <laughs> yeah. And like in but in this parallel universe, you're still hurting someone like you're still causing another human being pain which is not okay, even if it erases the next day and they don't remember it, or the other part of them existing in the narrative that moved forward didn't experience it. It's like, you're still, if there's some, um, even if it's like a paper-thin existence in the realm of the universe that you're causing pain on a person, like, you can't do that. Like, that's still, like, a relevant source of guilt. Like, you could tell, like, I I felt like there was kind of something there that he maybe didn't say that they like again they didn't beat us over the head with but it seems like at some point he really hurt somebody or he did something really bad because he said that multiple times like pain is real like you can't just like cause pain on yourself or others yeah i think in general like that that aspect of the narrative that like he was pushing the fact that like pain is real because we've been so desensitized because of the internet and because of reality TV and all that stuff. Because, like, you just are like, oh, everybody's just mean to everybody, so, like, I just need to be mean back. Mm -hmm. And, like, when it comes down to it, you don't know if somebody's lived a horrific day, like, a hundred days in a row. Yeah. Like, you don't know what people's lives have been like. (laughs) Wow, there's so much in this movie. (laughs) Yeah, no, I was very shocked that I got a lot out of the movie. (laughs) Yeah. Um, It definitely had, like... Midsommar vibes for me where I was like yep this definitely hit me at like the right time in my life and like it definitely had a lot that I needed to watch right now and like definitely said a lot about a lot of things that I've thought about like the last 10 years mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely on the pulse of like what is going on and like how things were Yeah. and I it was also like there was a point where I was like oh the Connor O'Malley character is definitely also in this time loop, but then you definitely find out that he's not in the time loop. And he's just, like, an asshole and, like, rapey and, like, terrible. And there was, like, no reason for Um, it to be an asshole and terrible and rapey, except there are just people like that in the world, and they're just going to keep living their lives like normal, and they're not living a horrific experience like we are, and they're still just assholes for no reason, and you have no idea why they are assholes and do this stuff. Well, do you think that it's possible to fall into a time loop? Uh, I think, like, they definitely got into the science of it and, like, the fact that it requires a lot of energy. So I guess, like, Mm -hmm. hypothetically, like, if North Korea was to, like, bomb us or something, like, I feel like that could happen Mm -hmm. if, like, they were to hit, like, a nuclear base in America and it was, like, the combination of things and maybe we got shot into a different dimension that Mm -hmm. way. Well, I liked how, because in, um, like, one of my favorite series of all time is Stranger Things, and that also deals with, like, a parallel um, upside-down universe, and, um, like, one of the ways that they describe it is it's all around you all the time, but you never see it, and I think that that is, like, a really profound way to describe something like that, but they also use the trope in Stranger Things that they have a science teacher who they call, and they're like, hey, if just, you know, uh, hypothetically, if (laughs) someone were to fall into this thing and blah, 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 like what would we have to do? And he's, he's like, well, 
if you were in that situation, then there would be, you know, this solution or whatever. And that's, there's always, like, someone in these type of movies, like, in any kind of sci-fi situation, that's, like, the smart nerd who's like, oh, well, I know what we would do in this scenario. And instead of using that, like, like, because in a, I feel like in a lesser movie, they would have come across someone who was like, hey, you're in the loop too? Guess what? Like, I know all about this. And they didn't use that. Instead, she took the initiative herself to figure it out and learn physics, which was something she obviously didn't know about. And the way she was like, they showed her like zooming with somebody and asking questions and like doing all this research. And I thought that was so awesome that she took her own initiative to do that. And we don't even know how many loops it took. Like that might've taken her like a year of time to figure that out. Like when you're starting, I mean, I assume she was starting with very little knowledge of this. I just thought that was really, that was like another really smart thing they did. Yeah. It just shows how you could change your whole life. Just if you focus on doing Improving on yourself a little bit every day because you can only change yourself a little bit every day because mm-hmm. you're basically living the same life every day. Yeah. And like you shouldn't let the 24 hour news cycle trick you into thinking you could change your life quicker than you can. Exactly. Especially like when it's come to being unemployed in my life, like I feel like people are just like, oh, just make it turn around. And it's like, yeah, okay, cool. I'll just <laughs> tell a boss to start paying me well for what I do and like go get this job. Mm-hmm. Like you can't just turn it around in one one day like you have to have other factors go into place and other people are living their lives separately than you yeah like in order for change to happen like you literally need to be focused completely on something or let it happen and like and it's the little stuff at, yeah every day that you have to work on like there there's that line in the big sick that i love where like he's a struggling comedian and someone in his family says like have you seen that Saturday Night Live you would be great on that show like you know you need to get on that show and he's like oh thanks like uh, that's a really good suggestion I'll email them you know it's like I have people say that kind of stuff to me all the time like oh you should just go on more auditions and I'm like okay just let me know like just you set that up for me then okay thank you Um, it's like and then I have, I have people say to me all the time, like, oh, I wish I could do what you do. Like, it's so cool. Or, um, you know, my roommate was saying to me, like, oh, you know, like, I, I'm not going to love my job the way you do. Like, you're a performer. It's different for you. And I'm like, well, I don't have any kind of, like, magic wand or secret sauce or anything. I literally just am on top of this shit every day since I was, like, a child. And that's why I'm even where I am today, which is not even as anywhere near as far as I would like to go or I have dreamed about going. But it's the day-to-day work that you need to put in to get out of your time loop, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Well, bravo to... <sighs> We're back. Movie, cinema, film. Yeah. Damn. <laughs> thanks Dad. for thanks for sitting through that long podcast, guys. We're we gonna love be you. back with some streaming guides, probably. Yeah. Um, if you got this far, I assume it, I assume you're Brendan or maybe Ruthie, another fan of our podcast. <laughs> hey, no, we're going viral now. All of our playlist or all of our lists are gonna be on Letterboxed. Follow us on Hell Letterboxed. Yeah. Um, New Jersey Weedman's Joint back in August, the first three Wednesdays of the month. Bring a mask. Bring your good vibes. Anything to plug, Leah? Um. I'm just bored in the house and I'm in the house bored but um, I guess follow me I am at Capriya Moon C-A-P-R-I-A-M-O-O-N on most uh, things so uh, including Letterboxd follow me on Letterboxd you can I always follow people back on there message me about I don't know the Danny DeVito Arnold Schwarzenegger comedy twins or something like that I'll have to yeah I don't know anything about this <laughs> <laughs> thanks y'all bye bye